Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the shortened 2021 season is over. The Flames played their last three games this week, and there's a lot to talk about as we wrap up the season. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, let's jump in before we talk about the season, and let's uh, talk about these three games. The Flames fared not too bad this week. Uh, the first game last Sunday... The Calgary Flames end up winning 6-5. to five. When was the last time you remember 11 goals being scored in a Calgary Flames game? Oh, uh, I think you have to go back to that Halloween game last year. Goals by Josh Levo, Milan Lucic, Matthew Kachuk, Andrew Mangiapane, Andrew Mangiapane again, and then Elias Lindholm got the OT winner. So a lot of, a lot of different Flames on the scoreboard here. Um, overall thoughts on this one, man? I thought the Flames did well to get up then took the foot off the gas and then went home banked one in off of uh edlar it was kind of uh like this whole week's games really were very much like no pressure sloppy hockey and it felt like, it felt like exhibition hockey didn't it yeah more like yeah we don't really need to try that hard who cares Win, lose, tie, who cares? We're here and to fulfill sponsorship obligations. That's why we got to play these games out. We might as well just play them out, and it doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. And why get hurt, right? Yeah. I'm only here to get paid, you know, or so I don't get fined. There you go. The, the quote from that football player. Um, but, yeah, this this one, when I watched it, the intensity to me felt more like uh, preseason hockey. And you were mentioning – um, Lindholm's overtime goal. It wasn't, I wouldn't say, a great, pretty goal, but you know what? You take wins how you can get them. Yep, exactly. And if we move on then to the game on the 18th, uh, the Calgary Flames playing against Vancouver in Vancouver. Um, in this one, Demko helped hold off the Flames on making 38 saves. Deming plays his first NHL game in 14 months as he was in net for Calgary, and we ended up losing 4-2, to two, the only Calgary goals here. Uh, Mangiapane and Kachuk and you've heard me talk this year about Deming and you know even before the season maybe we should see him play because he was an NHL regular and those sort of things you know in his past but he did not look good here you can no. tell he hasn't been in a net in 14 months yeah the, it looked uh, sort of like Riddick uh, in that Dallas game last year in the playoffs where like he hadn't played in two months three months whatever and oh here you get to go play up against the Dallas Stars and then unsurprisingly gives up a bunch of goals and it very much the same kind of game and it yeah it, Deming is not an NHL goaltender at this point and you know a 29 year old though guy has a lot of NHL experience I can see this being a guy that they or somebody retained as an AHL either starter or backup I've always said that I think you need a, a veteran to work with your young guy and if say Wolf is going to come in there that might be a good pairing yeah, he, he it's basically like with him it's another like Joey McDonald type, a guy who can step mm -hmm. in be adequate ish. If you lose him on waivers to some other team who needs a fill in guy, sure. And you know what and I think if Domingue actually had played a lot in Stockton, I think he would have looked a lot better in this. I I'm not saying Domingue is past his prime or won't get another NHL job, but I just think that not ha I mean if you hadn't done something in 14 months you wouldn't be very, yeah you wouldn't it takes good yeah either. yeah it takes a game or two to work out just to get your timing back well yeah no i i had no problem with that i had i thought the flames were the better team in this one and the difference literally was goaltending mm -hmm. i'd agree like if mark if markstrom played that game the flames win that one two to one yeah i th yeah. i think you're right i think the difference here is probably goaltending yeah, and uh, again, it was another sloppy-ish game, and yeah, it it is what it is. Like that, it just it was a game. Calgary got forty shots on goal in this one, so definitely you know more uh, more shooting attempts than Vancouver. Um, Vancouver had Demko in net, so not their you know not their workhorse goal either, but still a good goaltender. And I think you're right, Demko versus uh, Deming. I think that we would have seen. Uh, I still think they're better goalies, Holtby. But, yeah, I think Demko versus uh, Deming. Demko's the better guy. Demko versus Markstrom. Markstrom's the better guy. Yeah, and, I, you know, on the plus side, 
this these two games help to screw Vancouver over in terms of draft position. Um, they were slated to pick sixth overall or be in that slot anyhow uh, for the draft lottery, and now they've moved down to ninth with the, these two games. So, you know, small victories in that we got them out of the top eight. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I guess that's one way to look at it, right? If you can't be in the playoffs, at least make life more miserable for somebody else. Yeah, and, you know, it reminds me of that uh, year when uh, the Flames were in the final game of the season against Edmonton. We're up 2 nothing, and halfway through the second period, the, it, it got announced that the Flames clinched the playoffs. They stopped playing, and Edmonton came back and won that game. I remember that. And uh, jumped, I, I think it was from... Uh, fifth overall to sixth overall and they ended up getting uh, Sam Gagne and Chicago ended up getting Patrick Kane so it, and it was literally just because of that so you know anytime you can screw with the rivals it's always good <laughs> well we have one last game and again we won't spend a lot of time talking about this one and this one the uh, the last game of the season the 56th game of the 56 game shortened season the Calgary Flames ended up uh, playing at home Kachuk scored, s- scored twice and Connor Mackey got his first goal for Calgary yeah, he got his first NHL goal as the Flames won 6-2 to two. and we had goals from Kachuk Dubé, Mangiapane, Brett Ritchie Kachuk again and then Mackey in the third with his uh, his first professional goal Again, I would say this felt like um, th- this one to me felt like preseason hockey, but it felt like the Flames wanted to play. It's almost like they it was their last chance to prove something. Yeah, and you have to figure that like this team, like despite everything screwing up, Daryl Sutter is the coach next year, and. You know, like, if you play, like, crap in the last week of the season when you're done, of any coach, Daryl's going to be the one to say, hey, I remember when you checked out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your estimations in my books have dropped significantly. Well, and I think there's something to be said that in an 82-game season, not every game is... A crucial game right and i think you've got to be able to show you can play just as well for the games that don't mean as much now as you can for those games that are you know going to keep you uh in the playoffs or you know get you into the playoffs and i think this is one of those where you've still got to play well even when you're quote unquote playing for nothing yeah and you know like if the flames like if the the season was say 66 games i think the flames make the postseason but unfortunately they just it ran out of runway and but that's the case in even any season right there's been years we've oh, said oh it's 82 if the season was 96 games or 100 games oh i know but in this particular case you know cuz calgary was coming on rather strong the last month and a bit of the season that you know if things had continued i think that you know they would have made up the four points but it it is what it is and like, the Flames, they didn't just lie down and die. And, like, they could have. But they gave it their all. Mm-hmm. And, realistically, like, outside of them getting, like, winning the draft lottery, like, whether they're picking, like, 4th or 12th, like, there's going to be a good player you know, varying degrees of good, but there's going to be a good player available. And especially with the Flames scouting staff, like, they pretty much have hit every top two two or three round pick since Treliving has been the general manager. So, it's one of those things that, like, even if, uh, like, we're picking 12th or 13th or 14th, they're going to get a good guy. And I think installing the winning culture and instilling those good habits is far more important than getting a slightly better prospect. Well, you and I talked about that when Daryl came in here, right? We talked about the idea that maybe we have to sort of sacrifice this season to get the right culture and get the the guys playing the way we want, so next year we're ready to go. Yeah, because, like, I've always viewed... Like, if you look at teams that have won in the past, like, the only times that, like, a team is 
led by anybody other than a superstar coach is when they are like a, a ridiculously amazing group of players like Colorado Avalanche in 95 96 or 2000 2001 or uh say the Tampa Bay Lightning last year or uh when Pittsburgh won the cup uh with Billsma as the coach like it's one of those things where you know like if you look like you had Scotty Bowman winning a bunch of cups you've had Ken Hitchcock who's a very good coach win a cup like it, there's always like really good coaches that like the team's foundation starts behind the bench and like you saw the Washington Capitals like they were bad at learning how to pl play in the playoffs until a guy who understood how to play team defense in Barry Trotz came aboard and got them playing that right way and then they won the Stanley Cup and like this team I, for since Daryl was the coach the last time have been basically rudderless behind the bench and like all of the coaches have been kind of either okay or just outright terrible and now with Daryl back you have the strong leader behind the bench and that will allow everything to flow from there yeah I mean you and I have talked for years about is it time to bring in an NHL coach and there's some debate is you know Daryl's been out of the NHL for a while but he's a guy who's won a Stanley Cup and to me that makes you an NHL coach and not just you know a fluke where you're in for one year you won a cup and you're out he's been around the NHL for a long time I think the and he won two cups, and you know he's been to the finals several yeah. other times. So and, like it's... and I think this is a guy who now we have we, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go. We filled a lot of pieces we need this year. We needed a top end defenseman. We got that. We needed a top end goalie. We got that. I think now we've got the top end coach we need as well. Yeah, and you look at like uh, with people being concerned about Jacob Markstrom, uh, look at Florida Panthers for example. Last year, Sergei Bobrovsky was absolutely horrible. And he was getting paid $10 million a season. And Markstrom was just average this year. It takes a while. Like, anytime you're moving to a new team, it takes a while for a goalie to learn how to communicate with the defenseman and learn the team structure because everybody does do it differently. And he had a very good amount of success in Vancouver, but when it comes to the NHL like any little details like that it ends up in more pucks in the net and you know anytime you have to actually think instead of it being instinct it pucks go in the net and I think Markstrom had too many times this season where he had to think a little too much about instead of just reacting to the play we'll come back and, to that in just a bit here if you don't mind matt i want to finish wrapping yeah. up this week but i think your comment dovetails into something that was said during garbage bag day which we'll come back to in just a minute uh wrapping up this week with the final three games played that gives the flames a final season record for 2021 of 26 27 and 3 so if you look at it win loss that's uh 20, 26, 26 and 30, and 30. For 55 total points, so Montreal made the playoffs with 59 total points, and Ottawa is at 51 total points. We're right between those two teams. That puts us, um, if we take a look at a points percentage of 0 .491, so 49%, and yeah, we are fifth in the Scotia North Division. So where we, I, I would say, you know, where we've been all season. We've been at fifth almost all season, and we ended there. We saw Ottawa and Vancouver swap around, but we were... If nothing else, we were consistent holding down the fifth spot. Yeah. And, um, you know, amusingly, if uh, the Pacific Division was a thing this year, the Flames would be playing the Oilers in a battle of Alberta in the postseason right now, and we would have finished third in the Pacific. But, you know, just weird coincidental... Yeah. So as we always get at the end of the season, we get what's often called garbage bag day. The guy, the get, the day the guys go in and clean out their lockers uh, with a big garbage bag and take their stuff out of here. So many of us haven't even been able to do at our workspace. I was 
talking to a friend of mine who just went back to his office for the first time in a year and it looks abandoned. People's like sweatered and stuff still on the desk. So even most Calgarians didn't get garbage by day at their work. Um, but some interesting comments here, Matt, we'll go through these and let me know if you have any comments on uh, any of them. Number of players and the coach had some high praise for that first line. We saw the last couple of weeks here of uh, Johnny Goudreau on the left, Elias Lindholm down the middle and Kachuk on the right. And you and I talked last week about potentially converting a left winger to right wing. If you're going to do it, I think it makes more sense to put Kachuk there. And I like the makeup of that line and everybody seems to like it. The players, the coach, what do you think the probability is that we see that as let's call it our, our starting line or our first line next year? Uh, I would say as close to 100% as possible from where we are right now. Yeah, I <laughs> anyway. mean, unless we go and get a big right winger, but even then... Or a big center, yeah, but one it, or the other. But even then, I still feel like if that is our top line, we are still missing now a second line left and right winger. Like, we had two good left wingers. I don't know that Monjapani or Dubé is that ready for that yet, so I feel I, like you still need yeah. to go out and get a, a two wingers. Yeah, I, I feel that Andrew Mangiapane is definitely ready for being the second line right winger um, or left winger, depending on... And at the same time, the cost of acquisition for a second line guy is going to be much easier yeah. to swallow than for a first line guy. Yeah, and like that's where like all of this makes life a lot easier for the coaching staff if you have, or for living, I should say, uh, if you have that as your first line, because of the fact that Manjapane can play on either left or right, M Monahan can play either center or left. You know, so it allows you the flexibility of I need a second line forward. It really doesn't matter who. Well, I mean, it, or it, what position. Yeah, if you if you don't want to go out shopping though, Matt, and you're talking about potentially moving um, Monahan to left, you could probably make that lineup of. Uh, if you do want to move Monahan to left, which I'm not convinced is the right move, but if you want to do that, you could probably go Monahan on the left, Backlund at center, and Monjapani on the right, and I think you have a serviceable second line. But then you, yeah. I think you've got some serious depth depth issues if you do that on three four. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, which, yeah, like I, I think that um, more ideally, um, like it, it's one of those things that like the flexibility of moving Monahan off center is more so that like it it's one of those things where if you it depends on like what's available in the trade market what's available in free agency and who actually wants to actually come here and you know it like if you can get that second line center like uh, the flames tried to do with nazim Kadri a couple years ago then hey go for it and you can shove monahan on the left side throw up manjapani on the right and you're good if it makes more sense to get a right winger via acquisition cost, go that route. If it makes more sense to get a left, go that route. I think it the doesn't GM matter. needs to go into the offseason penciling. Well, I'd even say put in ink Monahan at center. That's who he is. That's what he's always played. And if later on you get a, a great opportunity to pick up a different center, then you've got options. But I think if. If I'm going into the offseason, I probably at this point have Johnny Lindholm and Kachuk as my first line. I have Backlund and, as you said, probably um, Manjapani on second. And I know I've got to pick up one side or the other. And that lets me figure out what's cheaper to acquire, a left wing or a right wing. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing um, that I, uh, like I've been concerned about with Monaghan... Uh, for a number of years, frankly, is that uh, his lack of defensive awareness. Mm -hmm. And, like, especially with a, a second-line center, you're more apt to be needing to go out against top lines, like, especially on, uh, you know, like, when uh, you're on the road. Because, like, if you're looking as the opposition coach, like, you're not going to want as much to throw the first line out against Lindholm's line because Lindholm's actually a good two-way forward and same with Backlund's line because again good two-way forward so you're gonna key in on Monahan's line and um with Monahan being so poor defensively uh, that's where I'm leaning more towards throwing him on the left side and plus with his lack of foot speed 
him doing that on the wing is less bad than him as a center. And it's one of those things. Centers are it, centers cost a lot to bring in, though. Yeah, I know. And it's one of those things. If you do that, it will make sense to do that. See, the only thing I would say there is if we are keeping Johnny and we're keeping Monty, I don't think you have assets to bring in a second-line center. Oh, I think we do. Um, it it would just uh, depend You're on... You're thinking you just it, go shopping for one? Yeah, well, there are plenty of... Well, there's a few good second-line centers available free agency-wise, and that there are a number of teams that are going to try to sneak players through um, the uh, expansion draft. And, like, you look at a team like Tampa Bay, they have about 10 forwards that they need to protect wonder if and you they could can do only a, get 7 wonder if you can do a deal with Francis to get them to pick up a center and then we trade them uh, one of our young guys for him yeah well that's the thing like you, you know like if I'm living right now I'm looking at teams that might have a guy that is likely going to and get even in picked. that case offer them less than he's worth but it's better than losing them for nothing yeah exactly and you know especially like if they don't really have you know like if there's a big fall off between that guy and everything else you know and they're willing to it's one of those things where like it's better to get something than lose them for nothing and or have to cough up an asset to not you know like how uh vegas got like multiple firsts and such not to take so and so um i think that um the flames would be uh good beneficiaries if they can finagle it and uh, depending on how you want to do it if i never thought of that but you could do that and we have money after this year especially if we lose the captain in the expansion draft where even if you had to take somebody's less than desirable contract to make that work we could do that take on a lucic type deal and play the guy in the bottom six just to put more veterans on the lineup yeah and like realistically the flames um because of the fact that they have have uh like I think it's like 12 or 13 million dollars to spend with everything that got freed up that you know like if you're getting that second line center you know like there are teams that are well basically everybody in the league is cash strapped as well and you know teams might have too many veterans and they might want to try that hot young I, prospect yeah, that they have I think salary cap's going to be a big currency this off season yeah, and Calgary is one of the better position teams in that front. So that's where I'm going with, like, you might be able to snag that second-line center. Because a second-line center is not going to be cost a ridiculous amount, Like where, like, a first-line center is going to be, like, a ridiculous well, amount. And here's the interesting <laughs> thing, right? If, if you look at a lot of teams, their second-line centers are getting paid with our first line center or if you look at monahan's our first line center their second line centers getting paid with our top centers getting paid right so if mm. you were to talk to a free agent and say hey i can't pay you that i'm paying monahan that my number one center at lindholm's four five you got to do that money or we're not bringing you in like it changes the scale if you keep everybody at scale yeah exactly and you, you might know, lose it, some guys because of that but i think someone who sees the value of that team and, and being able to fit into the you know the cap i think you've got a good argument there yeah and you know like teams if you're looking at like a non-playoff team out of all of the teams that miss the playoffs like calgary is basically one of the primed ones to bounce back like them and philadelphia frankly are the two that missed that and maybe dallas as well where you know, like, they're out of it, but, you know, that was a confluence of weird things happening more than anything. And, you know, like, if you can get that good second-line center, then, you know, like, if you have, like, say, Monahan's new guy and Manjapane as your second line, then you can have Dubé, Backlund, and miscellaneous right-winger on the third line, and, like, now you're starting to get, like, a full depth or Lucic uh, Backlund and Dubé that's on probably the third where you end up going yeah you know uh, and you know like uh, fixing the fourth line that's no big deal you can throw some of the kids on the farm like Godin Ruzitska 
you know, insert miscellaneous cheap guys yeah. from around the NHL. It doesn't matter. Let's move on to the second point that was made here. The general manager, Brad Treliving, said this is a good team that didn't live up to expectations. And he had a lot of uh, thoughts around uh, maybe COVID was the issue, these guys not being able to get out and socialize or see their family, that sort of thing. But he said that this is a good team that didn't live up to expectations this year. Uh, agree or disagree, Matt? Yes. It, it's kind of blatantly obvious. Like, when you have two of... I mean, they're they're not built... They're not built like a team that should be fifth in the in this Canadian division. No, like they're built like a team that should be fighting with Toronto for first. And, you know, like... And that was the prediction going in, not just by us, by most hockey pundits at the beginning of the season, was it was going to be Toronto-Calgary 1-2. Yeah, and it that's the way it should be. But it it's like when you only have four really good players, and two of them have like career worst seasons out of the blue it like unless you're tampa bay where you have like 15 awesome forwards that you can just throw out there and oh one dropped oh well here's another superstar you know unless you're that like there's not a team in the league that wouldn't be having difficulties like if you took matthews and marner out of toronto's lineup like it, I I would ha- see that the Leafs would probably miss the playoffs, you know, like or like kneecap those two players down to like what the production that Monahan and Kachuk did this year, like it it's hard when you're the your four guys, two of them just aren't performing, and like as a general manager, you can't anticipate unanticipatable things like you can't mm-hmm. you know like there's only so much that because people are human like the, well, we we've we've talked about this right treated his job of putting the right players in the ice yeah and you know like every it, this season was basically a confluence of everything screwing up and like the coach got fired you know you're having to adjust to a new system this, that, the next thing, and... Well, that's pretty common here in Calgary. The coach gets fired and you got to adjust your new system. Yeah, but it's one of those things that, like, under normal circumstances isn't a common thing. And, like, things went awry to that extent where the coach had to get fired. And, like, it's... Calgary, it, like, everything that could have gone wrong this season basically did. Like, Markstrom got hurt early in the season and didn't really look himself the rest of the way so it sounds like you agree with the gm on this one. yeah you want to keep us moving just because we got a lot to get through but it sounds like you agree with true living yeah. that um this was a good team that didn't live up to expectations we all as flames fans know some of the things that happened like you were saying the markstrom injury and that we probably don't need to, to chronicle the whole season but yeah i would agree as well that good team through various reasons like you're starting to get into didn't live up to to expectations yeah um I just want to make sure that we got time to get through everything yeah. here because we got a lot to go through. Yeah. Um, next one, Daryl Sutter talked, and I don't know if you've noticed this, Matt. I don't know if you watched the post game with Daryl. Yeah. When he first came in, he wasn't very Daryl. He was answering a lot of questions, and he was much more, I'd say, media friendly. And as time's gone on, he's become more Daryl. That's a dumb question. I'm not going to answer that. And I just have to laugh because when I watched Garbage Bag Day. It just, it's like, oh, that's very Daryl Sutter. He's back. Um, but anyway, one of the things that he talked about, he thinks that we may have put too many expectations on young players. And he specifically looked at our defense. Great defense, as you and I have talked about. But, you know, Anderson is 24. Um, Hannafin is 24. Um, you know, we've got a very young um, Valamaki there. I didn't really think about it till Daryl said it, even on the front end. I mean, we've got, you know, Dylan Dubé, who maybe they pushed a little harder than they should. Uh, maybe they were expecting bigger from Manjapani. Do you think Daryl's on to something by saying maybe we put too many expectations on our young players? Well, uh, y- both yes and no. Even Kachuk? Well, yeah, and it's one of those things that young players, by their nature, have ups and downs. Like... Uh, to go to a different sport entirely, like a lot of fans were flipping out last year that Vladimir Guerrero was terrible for the Jays last year. And this year, now he's made adjustments, and now he's amazing, like everybody expected him to be. And I think that, like, 
this team, a lot of the players are still having those growing pains. And, like, defensemen don't typically get good until they're 25, 26, 27. And, you know, like, they have a lot to learn. And guys like Manjapane and Dubé, like, for where they're at in their career, they're doing amazing. It's just that you know, they're still very young, and, like, they they still, could, Manjapane could be a first-line right winger, but he, he still needs time to figure out where that ceiling is, and right now, like, yeah, they're, you know, I think that at times, uh, like, especially with the forward groups, I think that, like, because of how all the free agent forwards struggled that it's like well hey you guys you need to do something because we're kind of screwed yeah yeah and i think young players definitely have have their place and often we see you know young guys get pushed in especially you know first round picks into lineup the next year because teams aren't deep especially those you know top let's call top 10 picks but we're not looking at you know number one picks here. We're not looking at top ten picks here. These are guys that we knew would need time to develop. And I think it's great they're in the NHL, and it's great they're getting development time. But I do think that maybe we lean on them too hard. And a young player needs time, like you said, to figure out who they are. Think about Backland. Remember, there was a time when we thought we should get rid of this guy because he's not living up to expectations. Yeah, it wasn't we had until to figure he was, out who he was. Yeah, it wasn't until he was twenty four, twenty five, twenty six that he actually started coming into his own and then and and we realized this guy's maybe not our top scorer he's our best two-way center yeah and then he really embraced that and has emerged as one of the best two-way players in the nhl and i would i would even say ben or uh, sam bennett was the same you know he came in i think we all thought he was going to be our next you know highest pick in franchise history the next sniper and he never really turned into a top six guy here but he had a defined role when he left yeah, and, you know, in that particular instance, I, it, you know, it's looking more like it may have sold a little too soon. But, you know, it's that whole situation is a mess in and of itself. But, um, no, it, and I think, you know, it's like uh, people having expectations of, say, uh, Peltier or Zari coming in and playing in the NHL next season. And realistically that's not going to happen um they might get a game or two at the start of the year but they are better off getting a lot of time in the american league yeah than playing eight minutes a night in the national hockey league yeah exactly that's how and and i've said this to you before matt i'm of the belief that when you call a guy up they have to fill a spot for sort of where on the lineup they're going to play if you're bringing up a guy who's used to playing let's call it 15 minutes, 20 minutes a night, and you give him eight, he doesn't know how to do that. If you're trying to fill a, a bottom six role, I think you've got to, in most cases, call up a bottom six guy. If you're trying to fill a top six role, you got to call up a top six guy. Yeah, and we saw how Glenn got in, uh, looked really bad um, when he was here, and then when he went back to Stockton, he struggled the rest of the season uh, because he changed how he played because he had to play a role that he wasn't quite adjusted to and yeah so it's one of those things that like it's, i think so often fans just wants to push the top guys in the lineup but you got to make sure you're pushing them into the right spot on the lineup not yeah. just putting them well in. it's just like uh it, like if anybody's going to get recalled from the forward group next year it'll be guys like ruzitska phillips godin Philp, uh, mm-hmm. Pospisil maybe, um, that are on the older side of the prospect curve, not any of the younger guys. and uh, Guys who really have nothing left to prove at the HL level. They should be NHL ready at this point. Yeah, and it's uh, on to, up to them to take those spots and run with it. And Or as an organization, it's up to you to say, hey, we thought this guy would project as a top six. He's not. Let's get some value and move him to someone who does see him that way. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, no, I, I would. I never thought about it until Daryl said it, but I agree on this one. I think, you know, you need to have young players. You, you need young players to grow, and I think we have enough veterans here that are young players. It's not like it's a team of freshly drafted guys who've been in the league for four years and nobody knows what they're doing. We have young players learning from veteran guys. You look at a line of, like, Lucic, uh, Derek Ryan, and Dylan Dubé. Dubé's learning from two great players there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think especially on the defensive side is – 
as Daryl was saying, Rasmus Anderson didn't have a great year. He was uh, paired up with Tanev for most of the year, and you could see that they, they were a good pair for a while, and they were learning from each other. Um, you know, Giordano was not playing with Tanev, the veteran. So we had this young sort of veteran, you know, our, our two young guys splattered against both pairs. And I think in some ways the veterans didn't play the way they should have there because they were almost trying to help out their younger partner. Yeah, and, like, that's one of the reasons why, um, like... A, what was it? It was Gio and Hannafin for most of the season. Uh, and, Gio and Anderson and Hannafin Tanev. Right. Yeah, and it's one of those things, like, that's why I would not be opposed to going out and getting another serviceable veteran. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the serviceable veteran that I would like to see most come back is actually Mike Stone uh, to play with Valimaki on the third pairing. Um, but I think then you still need one on the second pair. I think where we are, we need a vet on each on each pair. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, like, I, I would almost graduate the Hannafin tanev uh, pairing to the first pairing. I'm assuming that Giordano goes in the expansion draft. I was going to say, you're probably assuming the captain's yeah, gone. Yeah, and then insert new second-line uh, defenseman with Rasmus Anderson and go with that. And, and even when even when the coach talked about the pairs, he actually thought that Gio and Tanev is a pair and uh, Noah Hannafin and Raz were a better pair because he said that Anderson, or sorry, uh, Giordano and Tanev could play their games. They were two veterans that knew their games. Yeah. So he thought that was a better pair there. But, yeah, I, I mean, again, it's a great – if you look at the names there, they're great and they can develop into something good. I still think that Hannafin is the heir apparent to our number one on this team. Yeah, same here. But I think that you – but I think you – we have too many young guys there with Hannafin, Anderson, Valimaki, who didn't play a lot – I think we need to get some more vets. And even on the forward side, I think we need one or two more vets. And I think that might be – Daryl might be on some there with some of this idea that maybe we're putting too much pressure on young guys. Well, especially Valimaki. Like, he is an exceptionally talented player. and But he was trying way too hard this season to, like, make up for lost time, I thought. And – he was forcing issues when like he needed to learn patience and like he just needs to learn at the NHL level and like he has all of the tools to be a very good top four defenseman and I think that's where he'll eventually end up it's just and I think this also goes back to our forward discussion you're putting a guy who should have top four minutes on the bottom six or the bottom pair I mean of your six and I think that he is He's trying to show he can be a tough four and try to take someone's job, and he's not playing the role that he's given. Yeah. And, like, how would you say? It's fine provided um, he's not making mistakes because of what he's trying to do. And Yeah, and I would Valimaki, say mistakes, though, but also sometimes you, you try to show off too much, you try to get too pretty, even if it's not a mistake, and you just need to simplify. Yeah, exactly. And like, and I think that's been a problem with this team in general, is that, like, instead of... Like, it, it's... It, if you're making a play and it you're trying to make it overly nice, sometimes that's a good thing, but other times you need to just get pucks on net and you know go hit you know go out and f hit in front of the net and see if you can whack some rebounds in and you know like it not every play has to be pretty sometimes you just need the puck in the danger zones and go for it and like i think that at times this team just as a team wants to be the oh look at me superstar aren't i amazing and instead of just doing the fundamentals as well and well and i think this team and this is sort of another discussion we can get further into another day but i think for me this team spends sometimes more time trying to play the puck and get pretty than play the body and there's been times i've seen it where everyone's trying to get in front of the net so they can you know try to be the hero and somebody's got to go play the body and maybe get an elbow in their face or maybe get knocked down but so often it seems like sometimes we our team does not want to our our guys don't want to get dirty yeah and i don't want to say be dirty players but they don't want to get dirt on their hands is maybe the best way to say it. yeah exactly and like kachuk prior to the players only meeting was that type of player who would muck it up and get into the you know and 
wood push and shove and all that. And, like, the Flames need more of that. And, it like, it when Kachuk was playing like that and when Lucic plays like that, like, those guys are the most effective players on the team. And it's one of those things that, as you said, like, we need more of that. It's just finding the right balance to... And I think that's going to come with Daryl being the coach as well. Either finding those guys or teaching some of those guys that that's their role now. Yeah. Like, I, how would you say, like, I can see, like, Lindholm being more aggressive next year with Kachuk. And, you know, like, it, it's one of those things that Calgary, basically, they have been, since the this iteration of the team, have basically been a collection of highly skilled, highly talented individuals playing their own game in a collective manner. And instead of a team coming at you. And I think that, like, with Daryl, that the team will be more unified both on each line and from line to line. I think you're right. Let's move on some comments here from Milan Lucic, the man you and I both think should be the next captain of this team. Um, when he was asked what was missing on the Calgary Flames roster, he paused for a bit. Uh, didn't really want to, you know, come out and say we need this player, or that player, or this type of player. He said it was pretty much between the ears. What's missing is the determination. And we heard this from a lot of guys. Johnny talked about sort of that consistency and Lucic and a few of the guys did. And, and I, I don't... I don't think, at least I don't have anything that I need, really need to say about that. I think we all know that's a big issue here. Um, but I think that we, not us as broadcasters or us as fans, but the coaching staff needs to figure out why we're not getting that consistency. And and that needs to be, I think, more than just shuffling players. We need to figure out what's going on between the ears. Yeah, and like you look at teams that... Um are successful like they buy in with each other and like each player has each other's back and and each player knows their role it might not be what they want but they know their role yeah and you like with this season with the flames like really you don't have that and like it, it was a collection of individuals and you know like uh speaking of sam bennett like he was given the option he took the fourth line center role and instead of trying to work his way up for opportunities when it came available he pouted and demanded a trade and it's like you can't really get more individual than that and well and even after daryl came if you take a look i mean kachuk's ice time went down stuff like that i would imagine there might have been some some unhappiness there as well but like you said you've got to kind of say and lucic talked about this well what's best for the team not necessarily what's best for me what's best for the team yep i agree um but milan lucic did say that he believes the group as it's built can compete for a cup um, you know, he also mentioned that there's going to be changes next year, even when he won in Boston. The team the next year was not the exact same team. So, you know, he thinks this year's team is built for the Cup, but he knows changes will come. Another interesting answer I thought that came from Lucic, when he was asked if some of the frustration from the players came from miscalculation of expectations, he simply answered yes. And I thought that was sort of an interesting answer. The way I take that, and Matt, tell me if you would um, take that differently, but... I take that as I think maybe a lot of people, and we talked about earlier, thought this team was going to be a great team this year. And maybe these guys came in thinking they were better than they were, and maybe they didn't need to work as hard, and that sort of thing. And I think that, um, you know, maybe that miscalculation of, of thinking, wow, we're the best almost by default, all the other teams in this division are lousy, that they they maybe let – let their guards down let's put it that way yeah and like we've said this for years of how this team plays down to the level of their opponent and like this was the perfect storm this year because like in past years we play good teams we play bad teams we play all the teams the problem is is that this division is basically pure crap to be blunt Toronto's the only team that realistically should be in the playoffs out of all of these teams. And so Calgary 
they just kept playing down to the level of all of the mediocre teams. And it's not really a surprise that they struggled because they, they couldn't ramp themselves up like when they're playing a Colorado or a Vegas or a whatever. And, like, they... Like, in past years, like, they'd always get up for the good games against whichever division leaders or playoff teams. And, oh, we're going to go beat these guys up. And then the next night they'd play, like, the loser team and get thumped. And, you know, we were just playing all loser teams this year. And Milan said that as well. He said, we got five of the first six points, then we disrespected our opponents and the schedule. And so I think he's kind of getting to what you were saying too, is you've got to find a way to whatever the coaches have to do. And I don't want to get into it because I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a coach. I've never coached at any level. But whatever you've got to do to get those guys ready and treat every game like it's you're playing the top team in the league. Well, how would you say this is part of where like this team not having an identity of their own? And where it's been a problem, and why it's been a problem. Like, it, if you've got a coach who coaches a certain way and a certain style, you are going to play that style and that way every game. And but Calgary's coaching staffs, from like Daryl last time to Daryl this time, have all kind of been wishy-washy. In, in terms of like what the heck is this team like the only guy that really had any success with um the collection of spare parts was bob hartley and you know like bill peters just basically badgered everybody the first year he was here into you know playing hard but uh, like it's well and you were saying earlier it felt like a collection of individuals i think when i think about that statement you made I get the sense that we almost we have different identities based on who we put on the ice. Like when I look at different lineups, Johnny, Monty, Lindholm have their own you know identity. The Lucic, um, Bennett pair that we saw with Dubé had its own identity. It felt like every line had its own identity, and even within there, depending on who you shuffled in and out of different wings, we got different identities. It was almost like just putting guys together based on what you needed that night. Yeah, and it's like you need to be able to have an expectation of like the first line's going to play a certain way the second line's going to play a certain way the third line's going to play a certain way and it's all going to be consistent they all contribute to one overall identity though yeah and you know like say a fast moving uh puck transition team like the 1415 flames where all the lines were just flying all the time and yeah, like, I don't think all lines have to fly. No, but, but yeah, like I know that, what you're saying. I know, but like for that one season, that was the Flames' identity. They just skated, outskated all of their opponents, and mm. just used their youthful enthusiasm to beat and catch teams off guard. And like since then, though, like there hasn't been a set identity with each of the teams, and line to line, like. It, like when the flames had that 107 point season they were an extremely talented group of individuals and probably one of the best groups of individuals that this team has ever had but it still was a hard working group of individuals and that same divisions from the lines was still there where it was completely mm -hmm. different each line and like now things are just getting a little more inconsistent as like certain players like Garnett Hathaway moved on and uh you know it's one of those things where like this team in order to find that success like everybody needs to be able to play in a certain way so that way like say like uh Monaghan gets hurt right you can throw Backlund on that line and the other guys are not going to skip a beat just because you have a new center on that line even though it's going to be a slightly different makeup of that line, like the manner in which they approach and attack the team is going to be the same. Whereas like this season, if Backlund was on that line, like the whole dynamic of the line changed. And yeah. like, that's where the, this team is running into the same problems year in, year out is that there sure. is just not that consistency. Yeah. And I think, 
you know, and we've talked a lot about that since Daryl came in of, you know, bringing more consistency and identity. And I think you're right. I think a big factor in the offseason is not just new personnel or changing personnel, but looking at what is this team and how do we get either the players that are here to fit that mold or bring in guys that do. Yeah, and you look at, I'm going to go all the way back to the 0304 team when the last time that, like, the structure of the lines and everything was consistent. Each line had a little bit of skill, speed, and chippiness. And, you know, it wouldn't matter if you're talking about the Neiman and Nilsson Donovan line or the Again Lagelina Conroy line. Like, each one had, to varying degrees, good enough two way play, good enough chippiness, good enough speed that. You know, and like all of the lines, the Flames would just wear the other team out because it would be just fast, hard hitting, and they'd just be relentless on you. It w- well, and I think. Go no, ahead, no, carry on. I was just going to say, I think some of that, and we can talk more about this in the off season. Might be a more appropriate place to have a deeper discussion here. But do you create an identity and then try to get the guys to buy into that, or do you create the identity based on the guys you have? I think you have to create the identity and then, you know, like, say like a guy like Gaudreau. It, it is fine that Johnny Gaudreau is Johnny Gaudreau in Daryl Sutter's system. Because mm-hmm. he's just his own thing. Like, he's, because he's so talented, he doesn't have to conform to anything because he can just be awesome by himself. But for every other guy, basically, that is not Johnny Gaudreau, and, like, that's not to single him out, but, like, you look at uh, when the Kings were uh, winning the Cup, like, they had a couple of guys on that team that did not fit into the Daryl Sutter mold, and yet them as a group were able to be that relentless group and i think that like if players i guess i'm more looking at a guy like a dylan dubé where do you say we're gonna build it around what dubé is or a bottom six guy no. take whatever bottom six guy you want or do you say dylan we need you to play this way in this system well and i think that's what you have to do is your top guys will always have a spot yeah well i think that like you take a guy like manjapane right he's a skilled guy but he even though he's a smaller skill guy, he will engage physically and be chippy when it's necessary and will engage in puck battles. That's what you just need him to do, is just do that. Dubé, similar thing. He just needs to incorporate a little bit more physicality and just a little bit of chippiness into what he's already doing. Like, it's not... like It's not a completely no, different game. No, because... How would you say it? Because this group is a very talented group, like, that's why they had the expectations. It's a matter, like, with a lot of them, is just tweaking little bits. It's sort of like Monaghan at times. Like, earlier in the season, like, he was throwing some hits for a change. And, you know, like, if he can add a little bit of edge to his game because of his size, he would be a more effective player. And... You don't need to, like, hey, Monaghan, you know, you're going to get sat if you don't go and hit three guys. It's not like that. It's just if the play necessitates it, throw the hit. If it doesn't, don't. But, you know, err more on the hit side than the don't side. And No, I agree with you. You know, and it, it doesn't require, like, a wholesale change, but you also need to have guys, like, say a Ruzitska, or a, a Pospisil come up, who are that big physical guy who can and even your even your filler UFA, yeah. your Levo, Simone, who else would bring up Nordstrom? You've got to get guys in that mold, not just here's a talented body. Yeah, like honestly, this uh, when we signed them, to me Levo and Simon made absolutely zero sense. But it's one of those you don't know until you actually see them in the group. But it, it, like, my first reaction was like, they don't actually contribute anything other than the one little bit that they do. And like, it just, it seemed 
like just a filler guy and like which is fine every team needs them but it would just seem like a lot of filler guys yeah. so i think we both agree there that yes you build a system around sort of your coach and it's either kind of and you're right top guys are always going to have a spot right yeah. but when we're looking at the depth of the roster be it on forward be it on defense it's kind of this is the way you need to play under the system or we need to move you out to somewhere that better fits who you are yeah and like you look at like how the makeup of the team is like if you Lindholm naturally plays a little bit of a chippy game. Kachuk plays a very chippy game. Uh, Mangiapane plays a bit of a chippy game. Uh, Backlund, a little bit. Lucic, definitely. Like, it, it, on the defense, like, Hanavin can. Anderson has plenty of times. Uh, Stone does. Valimaki can. Giordano, Tanev, definitely. So, like, you have a... We should need to bring that up yeah, and encourage it. Yeah, exactly. And... Like, if you're signing a UFA defenseman, get somebody who can actually throw a hit. And, you know, it, it's not like you need to just go, oh, get Meathead who goes and smashes guy, but just somebody... We don't, we don't need a bunch of Ronaldos, but you need to have a player that has that in their game. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm thinking of, uh, like, guys like Jordan Nolan back when he was with the Kings, where he was just a big guy who could skate, throw a hit, chip in a little offense and fight if need be but it was kind of like that combo of a fast skater who could hit and like we need a few more of that kind of guy in the bottom six dispersed around whether that's guys like Rajitska and Pospisil that are big and can do that in addition to all of the other things but and it, it how would you say in order to let's, accomplish let's, that, let's talk a little bit about more of those those actual players when we get near the yeah the end of the season i think we get the idea of where we need to be and we can talk about how to fill those holes as we get closer to july 1st yeah exactly and uh, that's it's just like it's not going to require that much to make that kind of a difference is what i'm getting at yeah. So so we agree going back to the question that you build the you build the system based on kind of what the coach thinks and you either get the players to buy in and and sort of find their place in that system or you have to find players that will. Yeah. And uh, I think that with the key guys you can they have enough of that intrinsically that you can get them to do that and then fill in guys that definitely do that. So moving away from Garbage Bag Day then, we've talked a lot about some of the Flames comments. Let's talk about some comments from other media people. Frank Saravelli, uh, a lot of people know him from TSN. Um, if you don't know the name, he's the guy who's got the whole head of gray hair and he's in his 30s. He's one of their, their hockey insiders. Uh, on his podcast, the DFO Daily Faceoff Rundown, episode 30, I think, they've had the same core. They resisted making changes to the core last offseason. And in fact, in some ways, doubled down with all the additions they made with Tanev, with Markstrom, and they didn't pan out this year. And in his postmortem press conference, it was a lot of, this is a good team that had a bad year, and there's a team that's consistently inconsistent. I don't know about that. I think they're going to get a boost, and I think they could be a playoff team next year easily in the Pacific with how weak it is. I see changes coming. If it's not management, then it's going to be blowing up the core of the team, either Monaghan or Goudreau. Someone needs to go. They need a new look. It's been a, it's been so long with a lack of success. I don't know how you can possibly run out the same group again, having made a coaching change already, having added a goalie, having added an upper echelon defenseman, and then bring the same group back. So that's a quote from Frank Saravelli. I don't really have anything to add to that. I think that sums up what we've been talking about all year. How about you, Matt? I'm just going to start with like uh, True Living as the general manager. Sure. And first, um, and to me, like, his drafting has been excellent so mm -hmm. uh basically since he's the first year uh, that he actually did the draft in 2015 through the flames have been one of the better teams at drafting and like any top three round pick basically has been a home run except for the goalies so like it's you know um so I, like i'm not really overly concerned on that front and even contracts that have been signed mostly, like every general manager has a bad one, like a James Neal or... Uh, you and I but, have talked about Tree in the past, though, and said he's the right guy. But, you have um, any new thoughts on that that we haven't covered? But the whole how he handled the Sam Bennett situation, to me, really, really reduced his leash. 
Like, how so? Um, to me, like, prior to this, I frankly thought he had carte blanche just because, like, even, like, with how things have, like, the playoffs the last couple of years, you know, like, he's made the changes and, like, this year didn't work out, but, but that Sam Bennett thing, uh, like, that really... So, so what didn't you like about the way Sam Bennett was handled, or what would you like to see differently? Well, Treliving at one point, uh, said that Sam Bennett needs to learn that he's a third line forward. Okay. And, like, that that was, like, two years ago. And that he needs to have lower, lesser expectations on himself. And, okay. to me, um, that irritated so, that irritated me in a way like okay. even when he said that that you're cutting a guy down uh when he's still trying to learn and like it, i didn't find that to be a, a helpful comment at the time because okay. like sam bennett at the time had a lot of flaws in his game of just how he played and like they were fixable problems, and he worked on them. But he wasn't saying he's always going to be a third-line uh, center. No. He's saying right now he's a third-line center. Uh, no, he basically inferred that, like, he needs to lower his expectations for being higher in the lineup. And, you know, like, I... Uh, I remember that quote, and the way I took it was he needs to lower his expectations now. I don't think he said anything about never having that potential. Yeah, it, it just, like, to me, like, uh, how would you say, like, I can understand why Sam Bennett... Um, had that so, resentment. So was it just that one comment, or was there more about Bennett? Uh, well, it, it was like... also just, like, how uh, the team responded uh, to Sam Bennett. Uh, and In what way? Well, his excellent postseasons, when he was actually okay. given more of a leash to be himself, and he would be awesome, you should have the eye for the talent, that if the guy's doing that, give him some runway to see if... But don't you think they did, though? They give him runway and he get penalties and they take it away. It, it It's one of those things. Uh, did, uh, he, he made a comment also about Noah Hannafin and saying, like, he misjudged him and misevaluated him. And, like, with the Hannafin season, uh, you know, that he had where he was a lot better... It's one of those things where... Just for context, when was this quote? Was this uh, it, this year it, about Hannafin? Yeah, and it's one of those things where... It's like... If you're treating an NHL player like as a finished product because they're in the NHL... Like, I think that that's part of what Treliving was doing with Bennett or with Hannafin. And like, okay, this is what you are. Even though they're a really young player. And, like, it just, you know, like, not having, like, okay. not understanding that... So if we, so if we that... take the comment he's made to the media out, because he's not really the guy who makes the sides where those guys play, what else is the concern there besides the media comments? Well, just organizationally, that, like, that, like you mentioned Backlund earlier. Like, he sucked, basically, until he figured it out. Like, he was a marginal NHL player at that point. Okay. Uh, until, like, he was 24, 25. And, it, it, he, frankly, it, during that part of his career, he looked like Dustin Boyd. Like, he was just, like, a filler guy. And, like, if you took the snapshot of Backlund at that time, you would have been like, oh, he's just a filler fourth-line guy, who cares? And I think that, like, the organization has pigeonholed certain players like uh, Bennett, like Hannafin, as, oh, well, you're a 3-4 defenseman, you're a third, fourth line player. And not realizing that they're young players and that they can actually grow more. And, you know, like... The whole Sam Bennett situation, like, after his... So, so you, are left, you trying to say get rid of the GM because of these things? No, I'm saying that uh, the... F I would definitely shorten the leash on the okay. general manager. And 
organizationally, this is a key th screw up for this organization losing Sam Bennett. Okay. And it was entirely mishandled and a needless situation. Like, after Bennett had an awesome playoff last year, you know, like, they gave him the choice of being. A winger or a center. Now, any person is going to take the center spot because being a center, you get more money and more opportunities to be a. Okay, but the money's the no, same. I now. The no, I know. No, I know. I'm meaning like for future earnings and such. Like okay. you're, you know, just like thinking ahead at, from the player's position. So, like, if you're figuring that, oh, well, I'm going to go and play on the second line. It makes more sense to me to be as a center versus a winger because you're going to get about a million, million and a half more as the center. Just in terms of, like, if you're a 50 point guy, you're going to get more. Sure. So, so, so but, I'm still trying to figure out what's the issue you're having with the Sam Bennett thing. But instead of telling Bennett that if you decide to be the center, you're going to be on the fourth line. Or if you're on the wing, you're going to be on the second line, which the Flames would have used him on the second line. Okay. They didn't tell him that. We don't know that. Well, it he can't. We were there, There's a reason why he asked for a trade. Okay. You know, because you look at Josh Levo. Uh, I don't think any sane person would have looked at our depth chart at center and said, "Wow, he's going to be the second line center." No, but you, they still should have sat down with them and had that conversation but we don't know they didn't uh, well the fact that we he know demand, what's come out in the media. i know and the fact that he demanded a trade kind of tells you that it, it, but again we don't know he demanded a trade let's go back to what came out in the media his agent said that he said a few days later he didn't ask for that so we still don't know all the facts there. yeah it's just like to me like to me like the way that they handled Sam Bennett is the biggest debacle okay. since Mark Savard, frankly. So, so we're talking about these Cervelli comments. I'm not sure how this goes there. So well, it, you keep the GM. Yeah. But what is, I guess, okay, so you give him a bit of a shorter leash. So what does that look like? How does that manifest him with a shorter leash? I'm trying to get back to what um, this means going forward. Well, for that, it means more of um, perhaps adding an additional assistant general manager, sort of okay. like uh, when Daryl was the GM and then they hired uh, uh, Feaster uh, to be the assistant general manager. Or you could probably even say when Burke was uh, in the front office and Tree was our GM. Yeah, and, you know, uh, like I think, like even if you don't fire Treliving and maybe you make him president of hockey ops, I think that like with how this was handled i think it's a severe enough of a situation where they need to have new eyes in the management structure okay and because you, uh, like that was a major screw up frankly to me you and i'll disagree on that one i don't think it's as major as you're making seem i understand where you're coming from yeah. but to me i don't think it was i i don't think that the gm Yes, the player may have asked for these things. We don't know what was said. We're going by what we've heard in the media. Based on the story as unfolded, I don't know how the GM in a COVID season would have handled it any better. Yeah. But we'll dis we'll, we'll agree to disagree on that one. Yeah. Oh, I just, you know, because, like, basically the, the main problem is is that the exact player that the Flames need next season is Sam Bennett. And, Bring him back. Well, you can't. You know, could, Why? Could, Make a deal for him. Offer sheet him. Well, yeah. Uh, you can bring him back. If you want him bad enough, that's the guy we need. If that's the guy that's going to get us a cup, there's ways to bring him back. Yeah. Um, I personally don't think Sam Ben. I, and again, we'll disagree, We'll agree to disagree on this. I don't think Sam Ben's the guy. He's looking great in, in um, you know, Florida, but we brought in guys that looked great after the deadline as well and didn't look good the next yeah, year. Oh, so I to know. me, show me that he can continue to do it. I know. And... Um, how would you say it? Um, True Living, as you mentioned, has been the general manager for seven years. That, to me, is like the first major mistake it, okay. in my book. Uh, you know, like there have been minor mistakes, like James Neal falling off the face of the earth. That 
I, I think know. he's made mistakes, but he's always been able to fix his mistakes. Yeah. Say Brower was a mistake, Neil was a mistake, but he's always been able to fix it with little damage done. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, Lucic is not a $5 million player, but he's more of, like, a $3.5 million player. And, yeah, that's overpaying, but still, he's a good NHL player. If you kept uh, Neil at that price, like, that's a completely garbage contract, frankly. So, you know, he well, did maybe better. Maybe we'll have a larger Sam Bennett discussion on another episode. Yeah, it's just that one, like, it, especially with how... Uh, Sam Bennett has basically become like the Sam Bennett that like fans have been hoping for for the past four years. He actually was given a shot in a proper way and is doing it. Whether that continues again, as you said, who knows? But the fact that the Flames, like until like a couple weeks before he got traded, really didn't give him that runway. You know, like, he made change... Like, before they did, and he was bad, but he made changes, and then they didn't give him that shot. And that's where... Like I said, yeah. I understand where I come from, but I think we know... We've had Sam Bennett here long enough, we know what he is. And maybe he turns out to be good. And you know what? You win some, you lose some. Every GM wins some and loses some. But I think, like you said, if you look at Tree's body of work... And I'm just going to sum up my thoughts with this on, on the Sam Bennett issue. I don't think it's as big an issue as you do. But I think if you look at his, his body of work, you win some, you lose some. Tree's won more than he's lost. And that's all you can ask from your GM. Yeah. And that's not to say, like, the guy that they got for him, I think he will be a good NHL player. Um, we'll see. Heineman, um, and the second round pick again, true living has done a good job. Anytime they're picking in the top three rounds, uh, save for Tyler Parsons, which, you know, injuries, uh, you know, goalies and injuries, it, the, there's only so much you can do, but, um, it's one of those things that like the more opportunities the flames have to pick in the top 90, I think that, uh, the better off they are, especially with this general manager. So it it's just one of those things that, um, like, how would you say? Sometimes, like, I've been criticized uh, at times for being, like, a little too much of a, uh, like, deferring to the optimistic side of things and all of that. But, you know, like when that there have been mis like blatant mistakes like i do call them out and like to me that was a more blatant sure <clears throat> i'm not saying it's not a mistake i just think that your level of severity maybe on it and mine are different i wouldn't put another guy in the office just because he made that mistake i think you know what i don't think it was necessarily a mistake you do that's fine i don't think one's right or wrong we'll agree to disagree on yeah that. it's one of those things that i think that more it's um I think that they need another set of eyes just to a different perspective just to you know like another voice in the room just to like when they're making decisions and evaluations just to you know they've got three assistant general managers now with Chris Snow with uh, Brad Pascal and with Craig Conroy so maybe you add another one yeah sure let's let's add that as a as an off season piece for this team to maybe look at doing yeah Here's some other questions I have for you about off-season uh, pieces. Do you think that we'll see a uh, change to the coaching staff next year? And if so, what do you think that change will be? Uh, it would – I maybe. Uh, and uh, it would be literally just Daryl bringing in a guy of his choosing or guys of his choosing. Uh, frankly – Who do you think goes away at that point? Uh, it would depend on what area um, he feels is necessary. But honestly, I – I would actually kind of doubt uh, that any changes will be made because I think Daryl being in charge is the change. Like I, I think that the other guys do their thing effectively enough where, you know, I, I don't think that... Like, I think that the bulk of the coaching is coming from Daryl, not the assistants anyway. 
We saw Jason LaBarbera brought in this offseason, and the only real change I think they might make is getting Ray Edwards out of there. Ray Edwards never signed out to be an assistant coach. He was our director of player development and was sort of put on the bench when we need a body after the Bill Peters uh, firing. And I think that they may want to bring Ray back to that director of player development or some player development role. So, yeah, then be bringing in an assistant. And whether that's somebody that Daryl's worked with in the past or somebody Daryl wants to see as an up-and-comer, I'm not sure. But that's the only... I don't think you see this team gutted in any way. If anything, I think you might see one more senior coach added. Um, You know, Huska has some experience at the AHL level. Jelena, he's kind of here because he's the Homer guy. Um, Ray Edwards experienced, but I could see them almost adding an associate coach or that more experienced assistant coach to the lineup. I don't know who, but uh, that's where I think that there's some change that might need to be made. Yeah, and plus, like, if it had been another coach other than Daryl, I think Jelena would get shown the door. But because uh, of the extreme familiarity between the two, yeah, I, I would expect him to come back. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, we've got Jelena, we got Conroy, we got a lot of those guys here that Daryl knows and, and I think wants to work with. So, um, I'm I'm the only thing, like I said, I can see is maybe bringing in somebody else who has some NHL experience. You look at most of these coaches and their experience has all been AHL, CHL, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, we talked about one of the questions I was going to ask you earlier. Outside of, let's say, the top six uh, forward spots or the top three defensive spots, do you think we should look to fill our empty roster spots next year with farm call-ups or the UFAs? Should we go out and do the Josh Levo? Should we go out and do the, um, you know, the, the Dominique Simone or Simon? Or should we look to fill those with, as you were saying earlier, Glenn Godden, Adam Ruzhitska, some of our older prospects? Well, I think Ruzhitska and Pospisil probably would be ready for fourth line minutes in the nhl um pospisil was looking pretty good and would fit that mold of bigger unhinged guy ish that could fight and hit and be that physical two-way ish guy um so like that would be a good call up for like a fourth line right winger um other than that, I think that like the best bet would be to go and target sign UFAs that have that chippiness and foot speed. And I think that would be literally your two requirements. Can you hit and can you skate? And if you can do literally anything else, great. But that that's literally the two requirements. Yeah, I think if it was me, I think I'd maybe wait and bring some of those guys in on... Uh, PTOs in a training camp and say, you know, we'd like to put some of our farm team guys in there. We think they've earned the spot, but let's have a few of those other guys. Or maybe you sign a Buddy Robinson type player who can do either one, and you're not worried if they if you lose them on waivers. Yeah. But um, I, I think, to me, I think I want the the young guys to get the first crack at those jobs. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll put it this way: I would even if. Uh... It was a tie. I would defer to the younger player. <laughs> I agree. But uh, yeah, I I think that um, realistically, uh, the Flames need to sign two forwards and maybe one defenseman. Um, like in terms of like bottom six, uh, and like well, bottom four uh, defensemen, and like it has to be like the physicality being the more primary thing not i think not we, i think we have the guys to fill those roles i don't think we have to go out and go for agent shopping no we could just stand pat but i think like in terms of uh more like injury proofing this team uh because the flames don't really have a ton of prospects that are like ready to step in uh, beyond a couple of guys, like, it, it's harder, like, if the Flames run into, like, four or five forward injuries, like, then you're getting into, you know, like, you do need, like, a good 12, 13 forward, sort of like the Toby Reader 
type. But at the same time, if I look around the league, I think there's a lot of teams that have just their third, fourth lines as call-up guys. And if you get that injury, it gives you a chance to try and move somebody up into a higher spot. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But I think with the cap the way it is, you're going to have to start relying on cheap entry-level guys. Yeah. Oh, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't sign any of these, like the forward free agents, for more than a million dollars. Like, that would be... Like, it, you're literally, like, looking for a specific thing. Because uh, you're wanting to add a little bit of chippiness to your fourth line. And whether that's Pospisil or insert UFA, either is fine. It's just, I think you need to add that little bit of edge. Because, like, realistically, what I would like them to do is sign a fourth line left winger. And then a miscellaneous 13th forward that both fit that role and have Ruzhitska and Pospisil as, like, the other parts of the fourth line. I think it makes sense for sure to bring in a UFA for a for a 13th forward. I don't think you bring in a young guy to play part of your games. I think you're bringing in those young guys, whether it's Pospisil, God, and we can talk about the actual lineup as we get closer to you know, July 1st or training camp. But I think whoever you bring up, you want to be one of your top 12. And then your 13, 14 are, are yeah. more likely to be your veterans that can, like you said, slot in if there's an injury and you know what, what to expect there. Yeah, exactly. And like, if say like a Monahan goes down, well, then you go to the farm and get insert miscellaneous forward prospect. Yeah, or you put 13 or 14 in and, you know, depending on how long that injury is, and you hope that, you know, they'll they'll keep the, the ship going while everyone shuffles one one forward. Yeah. So I, I don't think that there's a necessary need to go and get more UFAs. No, um, it would only literally be pigeon, pigeonholing that unique niche guy for whatever... And I wouldn't be spending more than a million dollars anyway. Like, it would be literally... Can I you think some of those guys, a- Matt, if you're looking to plug those, those are going to be sub-million dollar contracts. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sort of like... Uh, like I wouldn't be opposed to Ronaldo coming back as the 13th forward. Yeah, but you don't pay him a million. No. You pay him league minimum. Oh, exactly. And, like, the max I'd go is a million. And... Like the fourth for line, Ronaldo? no, uh, for like insert, uh, like okay. fourth line left winger, you know, whomever it fits the bill of that generic prototype of are you fast? Can you hit? Great, awesome. Well, Matt, I think the only thing uh, left to do is see how well we did with our predictions and if our time traveling DeLoreans got us to the right point in the season or not when we looked ahead. You ready to do this? Yeah, it's not gonna be pretty, I can tell you that much. Who will have a breakout season this year? I thought Josh Levo. Boy, was I wrong. Um, I thought this guy could slot in as our number two right winger because we were so desperate for rights. You thought Andrew Mongepani, and I'd say you got closer, but he got 32 points over 56 games as opposed to 32 points over 68 last year. So A, a bit of a breakout, on, but uh, yeah. I'm not. I would say he's on par for what's expected. Yeah. So he, neither of us he did made too well forward enough. progress. But yeah. He made forward progress, but he didn't break out. He's progressing as expected, I think. Yeah. Um, who will struggle this season? I said Johnny Goudreau. You said David Riddick. I think David Riddick, I think, had a hard time adjusting to the backup role, but I wouldn't say he struggled. I thought when he was in net after he kind of got his bearings and when Markstrom went down, he looked good. Yeah. I know, and Goudreau was our best player, so... Yeah, yeah so I would say who struggled? Everybody but those guys. Yeah, we picked the two ones that actually did good. Everybody else... <laughs> that's right. Yeah, everybody else. <laughs> which, that, that stands um, to reason. <laughs> um, it, it's which, sort of like uh, my weekly predictions. You should just pick the opposite of anything I ever say. Uh, that's, well, I can't go the opposite, because there's, what, 24 other options, yeah. so... <laughs> um, I'll just say not that guy next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, which will both goalies be able to stay healthy? I said Riddick goes out and someone else gets eight to ten games, be that um, Deming or someone else, and you said yes. I would say I was right that both goalies weren't going to be healthy, but it's like playing mastermind, right goalie, wrong spot, or right color, wrong position. Yeah, well, One of the goalies did go out. Yeah, but even then it wasn't like a long-term... It, like yes and no like it, 
it, it's kind of like between the two of us, like where, because like I think uh, Markstrom only missed like four games or something like that. Like that's not like it was that protracted of a period of time. So yeah, no, you're right. I would say yeah, I'd say for the most part, both guys will stay healthy. Yeah, or would stay healthy, and I think just looking at the numbers, yeah, I'd say they both were. I would say that even though Marstrom was out for that little bit of time, if you look at the the starts for both guys, it, it, I would say it evened out to a point where Markstrom still got the expected number of starts. Yeah. Which is the next question. How many starts will each guy get? Um, I thought we would get 40 out of him. You thought 35. We ended up with 43 starts. He never came in in relief this season. Yeah. So I was closer, but not quite. We'll need to have like a plus minus something. Yeah. I'm three away. Yeah. You're, you're um, closest but, while not being over. So there you go. Eh, isn't that the way uh, it works price in Price is Right? Price is yeah, right? That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Um, and even then, I think you would have been closer if we weren't desperately trying to make the playoffs. Yeah. I think Markstrom wouldn't have played as many yeah. if we didn't think down the stretch we were – we were as close as we were. Yeah, because like if the Flames had been out of it or in it, I think that it probably would have been like 38, 37, something like that. I think you're right. But yeah, you have to throw your best guy whenever possible. And yeah. Man. <laughs> Who will be the first call up was the next question. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how we answer this because I said Shillington and Godin. You said. Uh, Mackey and got in, but Mackey was actually on the team to start the season, and so was Shillington. So I would say we're both right with got in because he he got called up from Stockton. The other guys were in and out of the taxi squad. I don't think either one was brought up. Yeah, and just to we did play. They were put on the taxi. Yeah, squad. and we didn't like uh, when Shillington and uh, Mackey played. That you know, yeah, it's kind of a. Uh... Because we didn't, I, bring, I would say, like we didn't bring Yellison up at any point or anything like that. No, so. I, I w- if if I'm looking at the team, I would say that the first call up on defense was Stone, the first guy who was brought up from the AHL to really play. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah. So yeah, it, I think it's kind both, of uh, like we're both right, but we're both wrong. It, you know, and even then, I have to look at I have to look at Godden. Did he get on the roster before Richie? I think he did. Y- yeah. So it's like. Uh, Stupid taxi Whatever. squad. We'll just disregard. Yeah, the taxi squad messed everything up. Yeah. We'll just call that one a wash this yeah. year. Uh, the taxi squad messed everything. So yeah, we d- yeah we d- we should have probably put. I don't think we understood how the tax squad was quite going to work when we did this. Yeah. Well, it was kind of a well, it's a new thing. So yeah. Uh, first guy traded. I thought Nikita Nesterov. You thought Michael Backlund. Neither one was the first guy traded. We can. I, I'm not going to go back and look at actual trade logs, but let's say that David Riddick, I think, was the first guy technically traded. Yeah, and then um, back, I don't yeah. think Nesterov will be back next year, but I yeah. he wasn't the first guy moved. Yeah. So neither of us got that one right either. Yep. Oh, here, Matt, this one we really uh, crapped the bet on. Where will the Flames finish the regular season in the Canadian division? What do you think you guessed? First. First, I guess third. So, I, again, yeah. I'm the closest without going over, I guess. Yeah. But, um, I yeah, we're fifth. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's so frustrating watching these games in the postseason where if the Flames had just had their shit together, they would be in the conference finals. But, <sighs> yeah. It is what it is, right? Yeah. This regular season, there were 112 points on the board, 58 or 56 games times two. You thought we'd get 74 points. I thought we'd get 68 points. The Flames end the season with 55 points. So we both really overshot that one. Uh, you should play the uh, Price is Right loser music right there. If, maybe, maybe one year I'll just pick one, and you can pick whatever, and then I'll, I'll probably win on that yeah. one so they always disappoint. Yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, Toronto did finish with 77 and Edmonton 72. So that, so if that, we, so if we, so, yeah, if we met our potential, we'd probably be about 74. Yeah. So like, that's roughly where I was expecting the team to be, you know, fighting for first kind of close, but yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> didn't happen. Um, obviously. 
So, and your 68 would have been right for third. So, you know, it was kind of in line with each of our predictions. And Neither of us expected to, them to blow this season as badly as they did. Yeah. Like, even if they went 500 against Ottawa, they'd be in the playoffs. <laughs> Which brings I, us to the I, next I'm a little questions. bitter about that. <laughs> How far can the Flames go in the playoffs? I said third round and lose. Um, you said go to the Stanley Cup, and obviously we both are not right there. Well, you know, on the positive side, during the postseason, the Flames still have two more wins than the Oilers. During the postseason. Even though we were playing regular season games, we still have two more than them. And speaking of which, excellent, awesome stat. The Flames still have more home ice wins at Rogers Center than the Edmonton Oilers. So... There you go. I didn't know that stat. That's awesome. Yeah, because I, I do believe the Flames won four games at home in Edmonton last year during the COVID so That skews thing. it a little bit. Yeah, but Edmonton has never won in their own building during the playoffs. So, you know, it's just something for hopefully a while the Flames can poke fun at. Namely me. The Flames, <laughs> the Flames unexpected playoff hero, as far as we predicted it, I thought it'd be Yusuf Valimaki. You thought it'd be Andrew Mangiapane. Based on the way things went this season, I think you were probably closer, the way that yeah. Valimaki was used. Yeah. Um, and lastly, what do the Flames need to do to be successful this season? Um, we were both sort of on what we talked about today. I said consistency. They need to start on time every night and don't go on a losing streak. You said not waver from playing their own game. So I think they need to figure out what their identity is before they can not waver from that. But I think that's part of what you're getting at there was they need to figure out who they are. Yeah. And at least the coach is right for establishing a certain mode of play. And we'll see. When you look back at the 2021 season, outside of the fact it's COVID and a short season, what's the one thing you'll probably look back at this season and remember as a Flames fan? Or if somebody brings up 2021, what's the first thing that's going to flash in your head? Those stupid horsehead jerseys cursed the team. <laughs> oh, so you're saying this is Blasty's fault. Yeah, that's exactly. Whole... You brought us back to the Is that just how we should gun... sum up the episode? Yeah. You brought us back to the, the Young Guns era. How could you? <laughs> Do you remember in the old He-Man show when he'd pull the sword out of his back and say, by the power of Grayskull, I I see the guys like pulling their stick out and being like, by the power of Todd Simpson, <laughs> oh, we God. have the power. To finish last. <laughs> <laughs> by the power of Clark Wilm. Um, Ed Ward. Yeah. <laughs> but even in those years, we never finished last. No. Right? The Flames have never finished last. No, because... We actually try when it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, there you go. Maybe that's how we'll sum this whole episode up is Blasty cursed us. Let's let's go a little bit further into some predictions there. Next season, full retro again? I'm assuming that, yeah, that for the next two or three years until they figure out. I, like, what I'm assuming is until they have a new building that they're just going to keep the same jerseys and then debut a new set in the new building. Do you think that the quote-unquote third jersey will stay as last year's jersey, which to me was kind of a stupid thing this year? Oh, uh, last year's jersey being the third, uh, the Black Sea one. Uh, no, I think that goes away now. I think that I think, think that was just basically a tribute to Ken King because he wanted the flags in the first place. And so, like, a proper set You could have thrown the flags in the retro jerseys. Uh, no. Like, no. Like, the, the retro jerseys are... You know their own, or thing. you could have thrown the flags in the blasty jersey and and killed two birds with one yeah. stone. Just add like all the bad elements from all of our jerseys, and then you know there's your third jersey. You can have blasty <laughs> with the script Calgary under it. Yeah, and the yoke. <laughs> um, do you think blasty's back next no. season? I I think that those are a one off thing. So I, there's always one or two teams that keep their promotional jerseys from whatever the promotion is. But to me, I think it was a way for the team to make some money. They sold really well during a year that there was no one in the building, but I hope that Blasty's gone. Yeah. And you know, um, like there's some of those jerseys that were quite nice, but yeah, I think it was just a nice little gimmick for, 
fans that, hey, well, you can't come to the actual games. Here's something neat. Woo. And, yeah. So, Matt, why don't we sum up this season um, with one simple line? Blame it on Blasty. Yep. Time to send you to the glue factory. You ruined everything. <laughs> wherever wherever Scorch is these days, that's where we want to send Blasty yes, to. Yes, exactly. Whatever closet that, you know, that... Uh, costume hangs out in that's where we want to send all the rest of the blasty jerseys exactly and you know hopefully uh the flames can uh come up with some good ideas for additional secondary logos and all that like i'd like to see them do something neat with the third jersey that's out outside the box but not like way outside the box if that makes sense and i think if you're gonna go with the retro look you almost don't want to have a third jersey for a year yeah We'll see. Yeah. Ugh. Like, that's... Not everybody does, I don't think. Uh, most teams do, but some don't. And, and I think at that point, if you are, maybe you go with something, again, more retro-inspired yeah. than, than, you know, your Black Sea. It just... It was a total... I always hate it when teams, like, change their colors for their third jersey. Mm. Or go with a completely different striping pattern. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe you like, do some uh, crazy, say, like Nashville, when they brought out that like puce colored with the weird triangle logo, and yeah. Well, even before that, they brought out the like uh, the skull logo. Yeah. So I mean, to me, if we're gonna do it, I'd say either if you really want to be crazy, go with the uh, the flames orangey gold color, or go with a black jersey with um, with still retro striping. Yeah, just do something interesting or different or weird or you know but not like you know some of like the really bad <laughs> you know because there's a lot of really bad jerseys out there so hopefully not anything yeah well matt will we won't be back next week uh we're gonna take some time off with the podcast we'll be back sometime in june we'll make sure that we post on all of our social media uh twitter facebook uh, Instagram, everywhere that we are, so that you know when we're coming back. But when we come back, it'll be focused around the NHL entry draft. So we'll be talking about what the Flames might do. I know you've been talking a little bit on the show about this for a while, yeah. but just talking a little bit about where we might go, what we might see them do with that pick, um, yeah, and we'll, get, like, get fans yeah, ready for that. Realistically, the Flames don't know where they're picking. They could pick first, they could pick second, 12th, 13th, 14th. Who knows? Uh, most likely they'll have the 12th overall selection, which there are some good forwards, some good defensemen. It just depends on who, what, and what you're looking for. And, you know, it, you got centers, you got right wingers, you got defensemen. We'll talk more so. about that when we get there. Yep. Oh, yeah. No, and uh, we'll break all that down. So we'll probably preview about eight or ten guys for that general area just to give a good idea. And then, you know, profiled, like, just generalities for the second round pick, et cetera, et cetera, and all that kind of fun stuff. So, Matt, when when we come back in the uh, in mid-June or late June or whenever we decide to do it, uh, I'll talk to you then. Otherwise, I will leave us with the, as we said earlier, the sum up of the season of Blame It on Blasty. Yep. Damn it, Blasty. Do you want to take us out? As always, go Flames, go. Not blasty though. Not blasty. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.